when I look in the mirror and I get ready and I'm like, oh, I look good. That's my dopamine rush. That is not narcissism. That's confidence. You just haven't seen that growing up. Meet Danny DMC. She's a YouTuber, plus size model, and confidence activist. She's here to show you that confidence is an inside job. As a child, I was bullied really, really badly for being fat. That was always the word I heard, fat. Why is the word fat have such a negative connotation? The narrative we're fed is the smaller you are, the more societally accepted you are. Everyone has to look perfect and have flawless skin and God forbid you have cellulite. I want people to consume my content and say, wow, look at her. She's so cool. I love how confident she is. She makes me feel like I can be like that. Success really starts with confidence because it's all internal. How do you feel about the term plus size model? That's such an interesting question because Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of the show. Here, we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing so. I am bringing Anatomy of a Leader live to a venue in London. If you'd like to be the first to find out about it, please make sure that you follow the link in the show notes to be added to the wait list. And don't forget to subscribe or follow the show wherever you're listening. Danny, welcome yes. to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So nice to have you yeah. in person. Yes. <laughs> in London. In London. Yeah. So how long are you in London? So I've been in London for a little over a month and I have a month more to go. But I just love it here so much. I might. I, yesterday, I toured four apartments. If that's any indication of where I'm, where I'm at right now. Interesting. Yeah, I could so, see myself being in London. Yeah, yeah. You like it here? I love it. Love here. the weather. I, I do. <laughs> I do. People think I'm crazy because I've lived in LA for seven years, and they're like, "How could you leave that?" Yeah. But I don't enjoy the weather in LA. I looked really? this morning. It's 95 degrees today in Los Angeles, and to you, that might sound. Again, it does not. Sorry, I don't know Celsius. <laughs> um, but it's extremely hot. Yeah. It's like if you're going to Ibiza, like middle of the summer, like that's, it's just too much every day. And I grew up in Chicago. And so I love the gloominess. It, it's like nostalgic to me. Like mm -hmm. we get two months of sun in Chicago and it's not consecutive. So like, <laughs> <laughs> like half a day here. Yeah, literally. Like half a day there. Literally. So yeah. I'm used to it and it feels mm -hmm. like very homey to me. I have to say that when you say that being in a place where it's very, very hot, yeah. I can't handle it. Yes. I right? love the London weather yes. as well. I think it's the best. Like if I want warm weather, I'll go on holiday. Like, take me to an island on holiday. I don't want to live there, you know? Yeah. 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 And then also, I'm in fashion. So it's like, I love a layering moment. I don't want to have to wear tank tops and shorts every day. To me, it's like... September is the yes, month. Yes, September, There is October, the reason why yes. it's a fashion month. <laughs> yes. I saw this TikTok recently that was like this girl talking about people that like summer don't like fashion because <laughs> I feel like all my friends that are into fashion, we always complain about summer because it's like, you can't really, in the US, if you you put like a good outfit on we say get a fit off you can't really get a fit off in the summertime because it's too hot you're you're like you can't even be focused on the fashion when you're focused on like Surviving. can I breathe <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes or what's gonna happen to your clothes yes literally yeah yeah, yeah so you true. grew up in Chicago yes I was born in Cleveland raised in Chicago yeah wow yeah and so tell me about how you got started in the the fashion industry yeah so it all kind of like every time I tell my story it's it's a bit miraculous still to me but I had finished university and I really didn't know where I wanted to go in life I struggled a lot in school because I wasn't really like a student you know your typical like my sister was my sister's very like intellectual and book smart and got great grades and that just wasn't really my story and I really remember in university struggling because I was like what am I going to do with my life like what I definitely am someone that has to do something I'm passionate about. I can't just like work a nine to five that I don't care about and just do it to make the money, which is what they try to sell you in America for sure. But um, I knew I had to do something I was passionate about. So in school, my, my junior, senior year, I got really involved in journalism. I was a journalism communication major and I became the uh, lead news anchor for my school's cha news channel. And I was on camera. I was reading a teleprompter. Um, I started an entertainment segment with a friend of mine. I was really I, I the second I was on camera for the first time I was like oh this is me like mm -hmm. this lights me up
up. I feel like my best self. I feel my most authentic self. Like this just comes to me. I felt super alive. So that was kind of a first indication of like, okay, this is a direction I could go. Then um, I was set to graduate in May. And in about February, I went to Los Angeles with my parents on like a family trip. And we were in this, um, we were go going to the Directors Guild Awards um, and we were listening to these interviews of these directors and my dad leans over to me and he's like, I feel like you should move to LA. And I was like, what? Like, first off, we're from the Midwest East Coast. Mm -hmm. I've been to LA maybe three times max. I know no one there, no family there. It's, the, it's a six hour flight from, five, six hour flight from where I live. Um, and but it, it made sense. Like when he said it, and my dad is definitely a hero of mine. So when he said it, I was like, okay, maybe I should do this. And it was kind of because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'd lived in New York city. I had an internship there working at iHeartMedia in Tribeca. So I was like in the music industry and, um, I'm from Chicago and there wasn't really another big city that like called me. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll, you know, find some work right away and you know, everything will come to fruition the way it's supposed to. And I think taking that risk and that leap, the universe kind of just aligned. I had lived there for about a week. I met up with a family friend and she was like, you need to get involved in the plus size modeling industry. Like it's taking off right now. This is 2017. Mm -hmm. She's like, it's taking off right now. You have the look, you need to do it. And I was like, okay, tell me what to do. I'll do it. She used to work for a modeling agency. She sent me all of this information of how to get started. I did it. Within two weeks, I got signed to a modeling agency. Wow. Um, and I, I got really high. I was like in the top 10 finalists of this big modeling search, the Torrid model search in the U.S. And everything was just kind of like picking up. And then I got signed in New York. I got signed in Chicago. And I was kind of bouncing around doing campaigns and working. And it was all, everything kind of happened really fast. But I was like totally down for the ride. And then probably a year in, I started to feel like, okay, this is cool, but it's not fully satisfying my itch or mm -hmm. the, the like inter depths of me. I knew I had so much more to give just off of my knowledge, my experience, my life experience and what I wanted to pour into women specifically. And so I started YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, I made my first YouTube video beginning of 2018 and it kind of just took off from there. And then I just started doing social media, you know, I, every app that came out, you know, I was on YouTube and Instagram first, then TikTok came out, um, and just really kind of utilized all of the channels to spread my message. And then pretty much took the full transition from modeling to content creation about 2019, 2020 is when I left my modeling agency. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like a crazy ride and like That's one amazing. thing happened after the next and I just knew I was like going in the right direction. Mm. We'll come back to the YouTube because I want to yeah. explore the, the plus size modeling. I mean, first of all, how do you feel about the term plus size model? That's such an interesting question because when I first started, I, and still sometimes I was very adamant to say I'm a plus size model. Um, one, because I feel like a lot of people are ashamed to be plus size, to be overweight, to be fat, to whatever you want to, whatever word you want to use. And that is not my life experience. That's not how I feel. I'm very proud of my body. I'm very proud of who I am. I'm very proud of how I look. And I want to spread that. I want people to feel that same way about themselves from the energy that I put off. I want it to be contagious. So I, I liked to label myself in that way because I wanted people to know like, yeah, I am a plus size model and I'm very proud to be a plus size model. I do think sometimes the word plus size is a bit dated. I feel like, you know, now a lot of people say curve model, but I also don't really love that because I feel like that's kind of become this name for mid-size models, which tend to be US size 8 to 12, which I believe is 10 to 16 UK sizing. Um, and we need more representation on the, on the larger spectrum of that. And not everyone that's plus size is curvy or has this hourglass shape or this pear shape. Um, and even though I don't, even though I am pear shaped and I look a certain way, I want to show up and represent for people that I don't look like as well. That's something that's really important to me. So I go back and forth with it. You know, sometimes it's like, why can't we just all be models? Why can't we, you know, just like, why can't we all be humans? Mm -hmm. But then there's also this 
moment for me where I want to be very clear that I love who I am and I'm proud of who I am and I'm proud to identify as a bigger person and that I'm not trying to fit in this box that society wants me to fit into. Mm. Talk to me about your experience as a model. What was that like for you? So, you know, the modeling industry is flawed, like every industry. Mm -hmm. And um, I think especially plus size modeling, curve modeling is such a new sector of modeling. And especially was at the time in 2017 that it was figuring out a lot of kinks and still now in 2024 is as well. Um, It seems like we're definitely backtracking right now. But when I was first starting off, I felt conflicted at times because we were speaking about this earlier, but retouching is a, is a huge, obviously, um, epidemic in the, in the photography videography space. Um, epidemic is a bit dramatic, but you know, I, I totally understand retouching and I, I understand it's been going on for years. I think one of my problems with the plus size modeling industry is that it was the intention with it starting was very performative and it wanted to be a copy and paste of the straight size modeling industry, which obviously there's so many issues with the straight size modeling industry where everyone has to look perfect and have flawless skin and God forbid you have cellulite, God forbid you're not a size two, you know? Um, And so I feel like I was hoping that the plus size industry would be a bit more radical, would be a bit more unapologetic, a bit more free. And I'm still hoping for that. I I would love to see, like, I'm just tired of seeing the same thing. Like, let's do something different. Mm -hmm. So I felt excited to be a part of an industry where I could be a pioneer in that way. And I think I found that there was no space to be a pioneer because I wasn't in control. Where with content creation, I'm in control. I I completely control the narrative. Now, if the algorithm supports that is a different conversation. But with modeling specifically, the photographers are in control. The you know, people running the campaign, the brands are in control. And if they have a vision, that's all that matters. You can try and fight, but they don't really care about your voice because mm-hmm. you are just your chess piece, you know, in in the game. And I think something for me that was really hard is, although yes, I have this like pear hourglass shaped body, I have cellulite, I have loose loose skin, I have things that people see as, when they look at themselves, they see as insecurities. And for me, I, I don't see that and I want to showcase that. But brands don't want that. They mm-hmm. want it, I, my body was often airbrushed, um, often contoured. I, I was on set a couple times and saw the photos after, I didn't even look like myself. And, I, I don't like that. I feel like I'm a part of a message that I personally morally don't align with. Mm. I have to say I'm a bit ashamed of saying this, but my husband's a photographer Mm. and so he photographs models, predominantly their, you know, portraits of faces rather than sort of like full body. And when I take a look at some of his images and then we're just looking, it's like, which one's nice, which one's not, like what should you do? And I've found, I've just caught myself looking at an image and completely dehumanizing the person who is on it and saying, oh, well, you know, her nose is a little bit wonky Mm. or, you know, you know, she's got a bit of, you know, spots on her face or the shadows under her. And all of a sudden that image is not a human being anymore. It's someone completely, you know, like not human. And like, would I say those things with this person in front of me? And I was like, oh my God, we're looking at these images and not even representing the person. Maybe it's not the person who is the model, you know, it's an image of something else, but, you know, metaphorically representing something. But I just caught myself in this very strange like nitpicking someone yeah. and I think how healthy is that and it's like it's normal skin texture yeah that's what humans that's what women faces yes. look like that's what I was gonna say is like you are not being represented you know what I mean like mm-hmm. that's the thing is like every individual behind the screen of social media behind you know looking at a photo of someone critiquing it Mm -hmm. oftentimes has to do with how we're feeling internally and what we're fed. We're we're all brainwashed. We're all Mm -hmm. brainwashed to believe, okay, this is what beauty looks like, this box right here. And if someone has a spot on their face or wrinkles on their face or fill in the blank, that does not align with what I've been taught is beautiful. So I'm going to critique this. But the problem is, is it's all very internal. It's not 
the spot on the girl's face, because you have spots on your face. Everyone has spots. We all have had a pimple. You know what I mean? We've all had a day where our eyes look tired or the shadows aren't hitting our face, right? Or our face is more textured or our body is more bloated because it's the time of the month, et cetera. We've all been there. If we had more empathy and understanding, it would, it would lead to a much better place, but also we have to have that representation to feel that way. So imagine if all these photos you have in your house, someone had a spot on their face or someone had visible wrinkles. It would be so common that you wouldn't think about it the way you do. Mm -hmm. But the reason that you're looking at it like that is because it's very rare that you're going to see a beautiful work of art or something in a gallery of a portrait of someone's face that has imperfections. And that's where the change needs to be made. Mm -hmm. If we see more real texture, if we see more authenticity in realness, it'll become normalized. And then we become less brainwashed. It's feeding into your own insecurities. 100%. And maybe not even feeding into your insecurities. It's creating insecurities in the first place. Yes. It's like if everybody's skin texture was shown that you wouldn't, as you said, you wouldn't even think twice about it. 100%. Just be like, well, it's not even a, it's not even my head. It's not even a question. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. And it's you don't so question true. it. Like when, as a, as a young teenager, you know, putting on my makeup and thinking, oh, I look amazing. Look how great I look in the mirror. And then you take a photo and you see it. And it's like, how did I just spend hours doing my makeup and my photograph looks like this? Whereas in magazines, it looks like, how am I even able to and it's gotten, like that. it's gotten progressively worse because when we were children, you couldn't take a picture of yourself. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have a phone when I, I think I got my first phone in eighth grade and I could only like call my parents on Mm -hmm. it. Um, but we weren't taking pictures of ourselves. We weren't thinking that in depth. And of course, don't get me wrong. There were problems back then as well, for sure. But even if you look back at like old rom-coms, Kate Hudson, you know, even like Naomi Campbell, Tyra Banks back in the day, they were not wearing makeup the way that we do now. How, how intense it is, how full coverage it is, how we airbrush our photos on social media, how, you know, we really are trying to have this clean cut look because everything we do is online for people to see when it didn't used to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard. I I do feel like there's moments where, okay, we're getting more inclusive, but there's also massive moments where we're completely backtracking and getting further away from authenticity and realness Mm -hmm. and the ability to see beauty in things that we're not taught to see beauty in. What I love about what's happening now and what I believe is the good that social media brings Mm. is it gives a platform for for people like you who initially went into an established traditional industry and realized, wait a second, I'm actually not liking where it's going. And I have a message that I want to share with the world. So you know what, I'm just going to go on this platform and talk about it. And I think you know, we look at the negative side of, of social media, but I don't think we really give it enough credit for what it can do to really spread that message. Agreed. And as you were saying how, it you, you know, you you wanted to be on camera, You it was, you know, you were lit up by it and you have something of importance to share. Mm. Um, how do you think your kind of activism for, you know, people feeling self-confident, having self-love, how has it evolved over the years for you? Well, I think to like properly answer that, it's important to know kind of what I come from. So as a child, I was bullied really, really badly um, for being overweight, for being fat. That was always the word I heard, fat. That was my kryptonite as a child. And um, it was rough from like second grade until eighth grade. I was in a school with the same kids from kindergarten to eighth grade, um, which I do not suggest, but, um, and it was really rough. It was really hard. But as an adult now, when I look back, I realize so clearly that I was really confused by being bullied. And I had a conversation with a friend about this the other day. I really do think the, the two boys in particular that bullied me, they felt my confidence. I think they knew that I was like a confident child and I, I believed in myself and it really bothered them. Well, how could this girl be so confident? How could she be so sure of herself? How could she be a leader at such a young age? And she's fat. She's something that society tells me is not beautiful, that my mom tells me, that my dad tells me, that magazines tell me is not beautiful. Let me tear her down because that's not right. 
And I was just always really perplexed. Like, why? I don't understand. And, you know, I was, it made me quiet. It made me timid. Then it made me angry. And I became an angry kid through my adolescence, for sure. I had a lot of pent up anger from, you know, the abuse that I endured. And then I think eventually the anger turned into passion in my 20s. And I became really passionate about my self-love journey and figuring out who I am and why I've felt this inner confidence. You know, a lot of people that are plus size or overweight don't have this. They all have a similar, more similar story than the one I identify with, which is, you know, we were very insecure. We hated ourselves. We wanted to change our body our entire lives. And I think I kind of convinced myself, maybe that was my story. And then I was talking to my sister about it one day and she was like, that was not your story. You, yes, you were torn down and people were constantly telling you, you should hate yourself, but that's not really how you felt. And it's true. Like I never really felt that way. And I think as an adult, now I can see my story went exactly the way it was supposed to, so that I could be where I am now to spread the message that I do. And that's why it's so important to me. That's why I have so much purpose and passion behind what I do because it's my story. It's personal to me. That 13 year old girl that, you know, went through so much sadness and pain and abuse and then it turned into anger. She needed someone like me. She needed this version of me to say, Hey, hey you know exactly who you are. So don't get it twisted. You know, stay on the course, stay on the path and keep going and do not listen to this outside noise. And I'm so glad that I was able to kind of see that and continue on. But had I not gotten to the point where I am now, my life could have taken a very different turn. Mm -hmm. And so that's what my role now is, is it's so important. Like you said, this platform, social media in general can be a super negative thing and a super positive thing, just like pretty much any industry or thing in the world, right? There's good and bad to everything. It's a tool. Exactly. And I think my purpose is I've seen so much bad and so much negative on social media. If I can be a light and I can add value and I can add purpose and intention, especially living in LA, there's so many people that just want clout, that just want fame, that have no intention. If I can do the opposite of that and really try to create a community where people feel safe and feel heard and loved and respected and they learn something from me and they take that and it adds value to their life, I am making that 13 year old girl so proud. She is blown away. Mm -hmm. And that is fully my intention. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's definitely been a journey to get where I am, but I think I, I always had this in me. Mm -hmm. I think it was always a part of my story. I think that a lot of times I feel like, yeah, Danny DMC. Okay, cool. I'm the face of this brand, but I really believe that I'm a vessel for this message that is supposed to go through me and to reach other people. Mm. I'm always fascinated with people who either discover their talent very early on mm. or possess a certain skill early on like where does that come from is that something that almost like you're born with or is it an early environment that has shaped you because yes there were boys when you were you know a little bit older and they were bullying you but you were like why are they doing this I was like there's nothing wrong with me yeah. but why are they still tearing me down so where if you were to really like take it back like where do you think this confidence where does it come from well, there's a, a couple things. First off, I, I really do feel like I was just born with it. I am someone that I really align with astrology and I'm an Aries. Aries, we are tenacious. We're leaders. We're powerhouses. We just, you know, we bulldoze through, <laughs> through life. And, um, so I think a part of it is just my personality and my character. Um, and like I said, I think there is a bigger purpose with me. Like, you know, people always say, I'm trying to find my purpose. I want to know my purpose in this life. And this is, de I think I have many purposes, but this is definitely one of my purposes. And I think it has been since the beginning of time. Also, I grew up in a really good home environment and that's something I don't take for granted at all. Both of my parents have been married for almost 40 years. They're, they're phenomenal people, like both individually, just great people. And my sister as well, she's my best friend, phenomenal human being. And I feel like all four of us have this bond that is really rare in families. Um, like for me, I had no friends growing up that had a family dynamic like mine. And it's funny because when I look back at the kids that bullied me, you don't think about this when you're a kid, mm. but one of them, their parents were divorced and, you know, had a lot of family issues. The other one also had family issues and you think, oh, okay, maybe this is why I had this, this strong character under me, or I felt this, you know, safety or security within myself because my family 
kind of gave me that foundation, that infrastructure. I had a really safe childhood. I felt very secure. I didn't see anything crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and the real first adversity I faced was being bullied at school. Um, and then I did face a lot of adversity throughout my adolescence, which I really do think shaped me to be who I am. I don't think that I would be as strong or powerful as an individual if I didn't go through the adversity that I did. But I do think that foundation that was set for me and that was created for me in this safe place of like knowing I'm coming home to this was a, a big, gave me a lot of confidence. And then I also talked to my mom about this too, but my mom, she, she would say she's maybe not the most, uh, she's definitely, I would say physically confident in herself, but sometimes she can be a bit of a people pleaser, which we all know comes kind of from insecurity and not having that full confidence. But both of my parents really didn't talk to me about confidence, but they led by example. Both of my parents were extremely confident. Even my mom, I have early memories of being in the bathroom with her. She would get out of the shower. She would be completely naked in front of us and she'd put her lotion on and kind of do like almost like a self-love routine and mm. me and my sister would just be like in the bathroom playing and to me that was such an early memory of watching my mom pour into herself taking time to really nourish her body and to touch her body and to be freely naked in front of her children mm -hmm. and it was like it's really beautiful when I think back on it and I think that showed me wow, you, you love yourself. And my mom was also in the fashion industry. My mom never left the house unless she was like all together. <laughs> and I loved that because mm -hmm. I could see it was, it made her happy. It was her passion and it, mm -hmm. it's how she loved to show up in the world. And then my dad was this, he's this incredible intellectual and insanely smart and just a leader by nature and watching him walk in a room. My dad's a type of person that he's quiet, but everyone, if he speaks, everyone wants to listen. He doesn't have to make a lot of noise and be like, hey, 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 look mm -hmm. at me. He's like very quiet, but people are like, oh, what's he going to say? And I would love watching that as a kid and being like, that's confidence. You don't need to speak up and to shout and be like, hey, 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 look at me, look at me. Mm -hmm. You can be calm, you can observe, and then be like, hmm, I have really something really insightful to add to this conversation. So I really give a lot of credit to my parents and, and my sister, and I think that I'm really lucky in that regard, and I think that kind of set the foundation for who I am. Yeah. It's a pattern that I'm seeing about people who are feeling completely comfortable in their own skin, regardless of what it is. It's having that foundation of having... It doesn't always have to be your parents, even, or somebody yeah. who, you know, you were very close to when you were younger, yeah. who just basically accepted you exactly as you were. Yes. Or Mentors, you know, gave you guidance yeah. and, as you said, was that safe place. Because then if those early experiences of you feeling completely validated into who you are, yeah. why would you question it? Yeah. Some boy come along, okay, yes, they can tear you down. Yes. But deep down, you're like, well, there's another message that's being thrown at me, but I still have that to lean back on. Yeah. And actually... It reminded me of my own story of when I first came into the into UK and I was 12 years old and I've only really just started to learn English. Mm. And I went to a school, which is not too far away from here, and I got bullied for the first time in my life. Mm. And I remember thinking exactly was like, why are they doing this to me? Yeah. Like, what, what have I done to them? And at one, there was one girl in particular and everything that I would where everything that I would bring, being good at, I didn't speak great English, but I was already a good student. Mm. And I, what is it? And at one point I just snapped and I said something really mean to her. And I think it was probably along the lines of, I realized that she didn't come from a good family. Mm. I probably pushed on that. Mm. And she got very, very upset that I got told off by the teachers. Mm. And I'm like, this girl has been in my ear me. for like however many months. I was like, I can't deal with this anymore yeah. because nothing else is working. And that really stayed with me about that actually when people tear you down, it's more to do with what they're going through 100%. than what it is. There's something about you triggering them. Yes. Um, and it might not be anything to do with reality really? for yeah. yourself. So being able to separate that 100%. is really important. Yeah. It's hard because, you know, children do need to be held accountable for the things that happen in these environments. But a lot of that starts with what happens at home. If you see your dad disrespecting your mom, you're going to go to school and disrespect a girl. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
And so I really do believe it all starts in the home. And like you said, it doesn't even necessarily have to be your parents, but mentorship, that's another thing for me too. I can never fail to leave out is I had so much mentorship in my life and I always give so much credit to the black women in my life. I was really fortunate to grow up around a lot of black women and I had two specific mentors that shaped my life and really taught me. I think, you know, obviously I'll never know the experience being a white woman, but the black women that I was surrounded by had experienced so much adversity and obviously oppression in our society and culture mm -hmm. that they were able to teach me how to, you have to ignore the outside noise because there's so much outside, overpowering outside noise as a black woman, especially in America, but really anywhere. And I was really lucky to be able to see that and learn that at such a young age. And I think that also shows the importance of being around different cultures and different people and different socioeconomic backgrounds and religious backgrounds. And I think that's the biggest thing for children is really all of this whole conversation starts with children because the younger you are, the younger you learn about confidence confidence and leadership and you learn to accept people as they are and you you see different people and how they operate and how they move it makes you a better person you're not you I always say when you are 100% confident even 99% confident you can't be rude to other people because you are so secure and love yourself so deeply like you will never catch me walking down the street and be like oh she shouldn't wear that or oh mm -hmm. she look she doesn't look good today or I don't do like that doesn't happen it like does not happen ever because I love myself which means I love you and I love every person and I want every person to feel about themselves the way that I feel about myself and so if we had that that level of confidence that that level of leadership that level of I'm okay to be different you know, I, I'm, I'm fine not fitting in with everyone else. I'm okay to stand on my own. Think about how much more kindness we would have in this mm. world, how much more unity, how much more love and appreciation for humanity. So that is definitely a goal of mine too. That's why I say with what I do, it's not just about, oh, you look like me so you can relate to me. I want to reach people that have different skin tones than me, that have different religious backgrounds, that you know are part of the LGBTQ plus community, that grew up in a different way than I did, but they can look at me and see, wow, this person understands me. It doesn't even have to be about her physical exterior. It's what she puts out and the confidence she exudes that makes me feel better about myself. And I want to learn from her. Mm. There's something interesting that happened. I'm doing doing some comedy acting course for fun. Wait, that, I love that. And it's very physical. And actually what I didn't really realize about comedy is how close it is to music and mm. to dance. So it's a, a lot about rhythm and, you know, timing and mm. like how your body moves and how relaxed and how, you know, in how present you are in your body. Mm. And one of the exercises we were doing was just walking and you kind of imagine and it was a play on power so we were like what is you know when you feel powerful versus when you feel less powerful like what does it feel and the teacher was kind of saying like when you're you know when you're kind of like of a high status you have a lot of power you know you're open you um, you know you're more likely to approach other people mm. and as opposed to when you're of a lower of status you kind of like hold yourself away you just sort of don't engage you don't kind of like pay you know eye contact and it just made me think of power in a completely different way and it's actually a lot of it is to do with awareness of your body mm. and of other people and feeling open to an experience rather than of control absolutely and so that just I was like that really stayed with me and what you're talking about you know confident self-love is that, is that feeling of, of high status and power? Yes, a hundred percent. You know, like obviously in America, we're taught this American dream, right? And a lot of it has to do with like financial gains and capitalism and how you can be the best and the most successful. I think success really starts with confidence because you know, I, I've watched some of your videos and hopefully I'm not jumping the gun here, but I've heard you ask, like, what do you think it takes to be a leader? You know, or, you know, what's one characteristic of leadership? And to me, I could tell you 15 things. I could tell you 10 different ways to be a leader. They all begin with confidence. They all start with confidence. And I think when you have that confidence, that foundation, every aspect of your life is better. Your love life, your friendships, your career, your health, your quality of life, everything is better because you have this foundation that 
I always say it's like this impenetrable bubble. That's what I always tell my community. I want us to build this impenetrable bubble around us where it's like when you need those moments to shut out the outside world and just align with yourself and have this confident foundation and you don't need to hear anyone, that's, that's the peace. That is the place you need to live. And it just makes you a better person. It makes you exude better energy out mm. into the world. It's like confidence is trust in yourself. Mm. What's the best piece of advice you've received about being confident? That's a really good question. You know, it's funny. I think I do what I do because I didn't really receive a lot of advice about confidence. I think kind of going back to my parents, I think the best confidence I, the, the best advice I've received about confidence would be what I've seen more so than what I've heard the leading by example from my parents, from mentors, from the different people that have walked in and out of my life. I think I just picked up a lot by being observant of how people carry themselves, what traits I want to have, what traits I don't want to have, how I want to show up for myself, the boundaries I want to set within myself. So I definitely would say more, more seeing the leading by example than any, I don't think I received a ton of advice on confidence, mm -hmm. hence why I do what I do now, because I want to offer that advice. I want to say, Hey, listen to me. Let's have this conversation because I want you to be the best version of yourself possible. And that starts with confidence. Mm -hmm. It's like what confidence feels like rather than what you know, intellectually yes. about confidence. And I just kind of a penny dropped for me. It's like, that's the difference between real confidence and kind of fake it till you make it. hundred percent. Because it's like what you know confidence looks like. Yes. As opposed to what confidence actually feels like. Yes. And a lot of it does come from seeing examples of it in your day to day yes. life. I feel like the fake it till you make it is very external. Genuine, unapologetic, authentic confidence is very internal. And so for me, sometimes I feel like when I walk down the street, I'll see people like staring at me and not in like, you know, obviously we've all been catcalled as women, not in that way. It's like, I feel like people can see my aura, like my confidence just shining out. And it's not because I'm walking with my nose up and acting like I'm better than anyone. Cause that's also definitely not authentic confidence, but it's just like, they see this pure part of me that I'm really content and happy with myself. I feel great today. Like today is a beautiful day because I said it's a beautiful day. I feel really good about myself today. I'm taking care of myself today. And I feel like people can see that. And sometimes I almost see this exchange of like people looking at me and being like, huh, she seems really confident. And then almost them kind of grasping it. And that's in, intentionally what I'm doing on social media is I want people to feel that. I don't ever want social media to become a place where people, you know, similar to the Kardashians and things like that, you look at them and they've created this life that is unattainable. You cannot reach that level. And so it becomes this kind of addiction of, oh, let me scroll and watch these couples and these, you know, famous people. And I can't be like them, but you know, I never want that. I want people to consume my content and say, wow, look at her. She's so cool. I love how confident she is. She makes me feel like I can be like that. Yeah. That's attainable. I can get, I can get there. And she's kind of telling me how to get there. You know, I feel like we need more of that. Mm. So for people who don't feel that natural confidence, what advice would you give them? I would say that the first place to start is with yourself. So I think that especially when we struggle with confidence and insecurity, often we look outward, right? So we want external validation, whether it's with a man, partner, whoever you're with, friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, we're looking for that external validation. It's very rare you find someone that's really insecure that spends a lot of time alone. And if they do spend time alone, it's not intentional time alone. It's they're avoiding the world, they have social anxiety, they're staying in the house and doing you know whatever feels good. I think that intentional time alone, where you are taking yourself out, going to a coffee shop, journaling, reading, listening to a podcast, spending time at home, being really intentional about something that always is great for me, which I got from my mom, is my shower routine. So taking really intentional showers, taking time, blocking out a certain amount of time to shower, to do a body scrub, to you know have a hair wash day, to moisturize my body, to put oils on my body, light candles, set, um, you know, put nice music on, like really make it an intentional moment for yourself. Almost like if you think, oh, it'd be really nice if my partner ran a bath with rose petals, like that type of vibe, but doing it for yourself. 
yourself and being really intentional in those moments. I always think in those moments, being in front of the mirror naked with your body, feeling yourself is so important because that's something we really avoid, especially as women. Um, and I think the, the more vulnerable you get with yourself, which is, it's kind of crazy to think about. We always talk about being vulnerable with other people, but we really have to get vulnerable with ourselves to take all those masks off and all the brainwashing out that we've been given in this world to get to the core of who we are. That is where you start. Mm. The more time you spend with yourself, the more time you get comfortable with yourself, you learn you don't need that external validation. So I'm someone where when people are like, oh, you're so beautiful, I'm like, thank you. But it doesn't, I don't get this like dopamine rush where when I look in the mirror and I get ready and I'm like, oh, I look good. That's my dopamine rush because it's all internal. And that's the best place to start. And it takes time. It's not like this is going to happen overnight, but the more you spend time with yourself and have those intentional moments, you realize that it's the most beautiful place to be. And again, like I said earlier, your relationships get better because of that. Your quality of life gets better because of that. Your health. Another thing I'm really big on is I am a plus size woman. I love being a plus size woman, but I'm very intentional about my health. So I'm vegetarian. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke weed, which is very common in the U S I don't know about here. Um, I definitely don't smoke cigarettes and uh, I don't drink coffee or caffeine. I'm very intentional with what I put in my body. Now, don't get me wrong. I indulge. I love sweets from time to time. Um, but taking care of my health, taking care of my heart, taking care of my body, that is self-love. That's a huge form of self-love. Now don't get it twisted. Wanting to be a size two and overworking yourself and overexerting yourself is not self-love. I can be this size. I go to my doctor. My, I'm nowhere near diabetes. My cholesterol is amazing. My heart is great. And I, I, I don't know, um, I don't know kgs, but I'm 230 pounds. I think that's like 108 kgs if I'm right. Um, and that's something, again, like women, we don't talk about our weight. Like I'm probably the first person on this podcast that has said this, said their weight. And I have no problem with that because I'm so happy with who I am and where my body is. It's no one else's business and mm -hmm. it's not up for discussion. My body is not up for discussion. Mm -hmm. And when you spend that time alone, you learn how to set boundaries. You learn how to set boundaries within yourself too, which is really important for me. Like people say, don't you have days where you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're like, mm, I'm just not feeling it today. And the honest answer is no, not really. Like it's very, very, very rare. And if I do, I restart and I reset right away because I have boundaries with myself. I do not speak negatively to myself in the mm -hmm. mirror. I do not speak negatively about myself out loud. And that's something we need to start holding our friends accountable for too. If I have a friend that's like, oh, I feel so fat today, or I feel so this, you're getting, you're this getting is a, so British, by the way, you're yes, like, oh, to. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, I'm, you know, got a little bit here or, you know, yeah. oh, put on weight. Oh, look, my head looks a mess. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very British. I know. Thing. And I've noticed that too. And I think that's why I could do a lot here. I, I, mm -hmm. I had this conversation with my makeup artist. Um, she's uh, my UK makeup artist. She, uh, I was telling, talking to her about how I just have this feeling from the women I've gotten to know and just the general vibe that I do believe UK women are talking to be even more secure than U.S. women. Uh, insecure, I'm sorry. Right. U UK women are taught to be more insecure and kind of look down on themselves more. Like this self-depreciation yes, like, is, a, is a desirable quality. Yes, and like God forbid you're cocky or narcissistic or, you know, it's all these negative things instead of mm -hmm. being a confident woman, which happens in the U.S. too. People will say to me, oh, you're, even my dad, I had to correct him a couple times. He'd be like, you're so narcissistic because I will look in the mirror and be like, oh, I look good. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That is not narcissism. That's confidence. You just haven't seen that growing up. And I think that I, even I was out with friends a couple of days ago and a friend of mine who's skinny was like, do I look fat in this? And I was like, well, if you did, you'd look great. Because why is the word fat such a ne have such a negative connotation? Because I'm fat. Like technically, if you look at the scales, I am obese on the, on the health chart and I look good. So if I'm fat and I look this good and you think you look fat, then damn, you must look really good. And it blows people's minds when I say things like that. They're like, oh, and then immediately they feel bad. Like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And I was like, it doesn't offend me, but it should offend you that you're talking that negatively about mm. yourself. I'd love to feel how you feel. And I love what you're saying that you want other people to feel how you feel. So personally, recently I have lost some weight. Mm on purpose, but very slowly. Mm. So I'm back to the size I was pre-kids. Mm. And I have been working my butt off in the gym, but also taking, you know, very slowly in terms of like eating. And I feel great. Like I feel really good in my body. 
And when I and I hate to admit this, but when I look in the mirror and I see that I am thinner than I was, I feel good about it. Mm. And in my head, I'm like, do I feel good because I'm just more energetic, I'm more sporty, or do I feel good because I now fit the more I'm closer to the social mm. ideal? And I think those two things are so inextricably linked because, you know, when you look at the women in the magazines, you look at what's supposed to be attractive, you know, all of these messages are in your head. And I'd love to say it's like, oh, I'll be happy whatever the size I am. But I genuinely was not yeah. when I was heavier. Yeah. And I don't know which one is the case. Maybe yeah. if I didn't see those images, I'd be like, whatever, I'm just yeah. happy in my body. But it affected me in a way for years, for years. Yeah. And there was this article about a year ago from The Economist, and I think they've done several of those in the past as well, which looks at studies that show that, and I'm going to read out what the first sentence of it was. So where is it? Um, it's like, for an obese woman, losing weight could boost her salary by as much as obtaining a master's degree. And across the developed world, the richer people are, the thinner they tend to be. So basically, as a society... That's crazy. We equate not only thinness to health, but thinness to success. Yeah, that is... Wow, wow. I have to take that quote in. I hate that quote, first off. Um, this is the studies. I haven't read yeah, the full yeah. article. This yeah, is yeah. literally like the beginning. Yeah, no, totally understandable. And, and I feel like it's something a lot of people would agree with. I think... Um, I think... Exactly what you just spoke about in your own experience is what you came into was confidence. You feel more confident because you lost weight and we tie those together. So just like the kids that bullied me, they saw a bigger girl and they thought insecurity is synonymous with being overweight or being obese. And that's my whole thing is showing very different, right? Someone from the economist would look at me and say, okay, this is an overweight girl. And so she probably doesn't like herself. And if she lost more weight and was under 200 pounds, she would feel a lot happier and she would probably be more successful. But that's not my story. I'm so happy. I love my body. I have no desire to be smaller than I am. And I am extremely successful. <laughs> so clearly that study is not all the way right. But I think again, and it, this all ties back to confidence, is what they're saying here that you could get a better job or a career or make more money is because people feel more confident. And they feel more confident because of the storyline that they're told. So the narrative that we're fed is the smaller you are, the more societally acceptable or accepted you are, and that you'll feel better about yourself. I even remember having conversations with my mom when I was young, and my mom was really real with me. She said, you know, life is going to be harder. You are going to be, you know, prejudged. There will be prejudices against you at work, whatever, being a bigger girl. And, you know, obviously those are conversations that shouldn't be had to me. There are conversations that need to be had to the bosses and the CEOs. And why are we judging people based on how they physically look? Now there's this fine line of, Again, I really am a supporter in health and taking care of our bodies. I don't believe that you can fully love yourself if you're not taking care of your body. And that is if you're 300 pounds, you know, 200 kg, or if you are, you know, 40 kg. I don't know kg at all. You're very small, okay? You're 100 pounds. So it doesn't matter if you are overweight or underweight. There's ways that you cannot take care of your body. You can, you know, binge eat. You can you know, not take care of your body in a, in a, in a way that makes you gain weight, but then you can also starve yourself. You can, you know, make yourself throw up all of these things that are extremely unhealthy as well so that you can be a size zero. And what we need to find is this common ground, which I feel like I am in that area of, you know, I've struggled with my weight. I've been much bigger than I am now. I've never been well, I've been smaller than I was now, but I was very unhappy and it was not healthy for me, mm -hmm. um, but haven't been much smaller than I am now. I meant to be a plus size woman and I love that I've been able to accept that because now, like I said, if you ask any of my friends in LA, where LA is a relatively healthy place, all of my friends that are, you know, as skinny as they come, they always are like, Danny's the healthiest friend I have. Danny is the healthiest person I know. I'm so aware of everything that I put in my body. But in a, in, a, in a mentally healthy way. I'm not counting every calorie I eat. I'm not overthinking it. 
but I'm very aware and intentional with what I put in my body. But like I said, I indulge, I'm going to have a croissant every now and then, you know, I'm going to have a matcha, even though I don't drink caffeine, sometimes I will have a matcha and it probably has sweetener in it because that's all (laughs) coffee shops know nowadays. Um, I think everything in moderation is really important. And I think my mom raised me on an 80, 20 rule, 80% health and really focused on what you're doing. And 20% you have to live and you have to indulge and enjoy life. If you're in Italy, you better have some homemade pasta with all the Parmesan cheese you on top. Okay. Not. <laughs> yes. Like yeah. you're, you'd be crazy not mm-hmm. to. So I think we need to find this balance, um, of being in the middle and what we'll find when taking care of our health is it really has nothing to do with weight. If you are focused on losing weight instead of how you feel inside, to me, the most important thing that you said was that you feel good and that you have more energy and you feel like you can do more. And I feel that way too when I'm 230. 230 is like my my lower weight where I like to be. And I feel like I can walk for miles and I can, you know, run upstairs. And right now the Airbnb I'm staying at is a three floor walk up. So it's really six floors that I'm walking with my groceries and my bags and everything. And I can do it and I'm good. Um, that makes me feel good. So if we separate this conversation of health being synonymous with weight, I think we would be in a much mentally healthier space. Mm, No, for sure. And I think it's separating the shape of you, the size of you, the look of you away from health and also success. And I think just in defense of that article, which I've loosely read. So, and I think what it's arguing is that it's less about how you feel inside it's more about the perception of the external world yeah on how you're treated but i just feel like by saying if obese women lost weight we're putting it on the women because what we really should be saying is if ceos if owners of the company were not prejudiced towards obese women they would be more successful they'd probably have more confidence and they would make more money that's really how it should be worded but yeah but again it's often put on and especially as women we know things are often put on us and there's not a lot of accountability for other people, mm-hmm. especially men yes. <laughs> in, in society. And so these are changes that need to be made. And mm-hmm. I'm someone that's very vocal about making those changes. So when I see an article like that, I want to tear it apart. I love that you brought it up. That's like, that's amazing because I feel like I can really easily nitpick that article where there's definitely facts in there for sure. But why are they facts? What's the underlying deep message? And that's kind of who I am is I want to break down and go to the surface because like we talked about that foundation is where everything is set. We can't talk about the kerfuffle up here if we don't talk about the root of it. I think it's the same thing as those boys who were like, well, she looks a certain way. So we're going to, you know, make assumptions about her that she can't be that confident and she can't be that yeah. you know good at what she does and then let's tear it down exactly <laughs> yeah um let's talk about relationships okay <laughs> <laughs> you're like you lead the conversation well there's a lot my, i can the, say about because going back to like the early years and kind of finding yourself and being attracted to the opposite sex and maybe not opposite sex. Sorry, I'm making assumptions. No, 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 it's okay. (laughs) I am am only attracted to the opposite sex. Um, So, you know, being attracted and how confident you are in terms of either approaching that relationship Mm. or, you know, starting it or how other people perceive you. Yeah. So talk to me about those very early, early years. Yeah, there's so much to be said about relationships um, and being a plus size, curvier, bigger woman, because again, there's so much that's fed to us. And then not only us that you have to worry about, in this case, obviously, fill in the blank for partner, but I am a heterosexual woman. So for me, it's the opposite sex. It's men are so brainwashed as well. And I had so many experiences growing up where I would like a guy and he would like me, but he'd want it to be on the down low because God forbid his friends know he's dating a fat girl. And then again, for me growing up, most of my friend groups, I was the only white girl. So it was like, you're dating the fat white girl. Like it's too much, it stands out too much. And um, so I was often the girl that was hidden, you know, or I was the girl that was with a guy that was cheating on her, you know, with multiple people. Um, And I really had to, again, there was a lot of confusion, like, I would want to show me off. Like, that's crazy. And now I, I still struggle with it because now I'm this person that 
I get a lot of attention, a lot of male attention from, you know, guys I would have killed to get attention from back in the day. And they look at me like I'm the prize. And it's like, I've always known I was the prize. (laughs) Like you're just figuring this out. Um, but it was definitely, it was a journey as a kid growing up and figuring out that men wanted things from me, especially I think because they assumed I was more insecure. They thought that I would like offer things more sexually and I was not like that. Did that happen? Oh yeah. I was like in America too. I feel like our culture is much more intense as well. Sexually. I've kind of learned that compared to the UK. Um, and so yeah, guys would, I, I was luckily again, I had that leadership and confidence I think my parents thought I like, you know, might've lost my virginity quite young. I didn't lose my virginity until I was 18. I was very, I told guys, no, like it was fine. <laughs> like it was like, my you, like job. The, like the ticks instead. Literally. It's like, how many guys yes, I'm going to say no to? <laughs> um, but guys thought for sure, like I was just going to give it up because that was kind of this societal norm that if you were overweight and you were probably insecure you weren't going to say no. Why would you say no? This is a man offering to love you or give you attention or, you know, whatever, connect in this sexual way. I saw right through that. I was like, no, I'm good. I don't need that from you. Um, And so I, again, I'm really glad I had that leadership, that confidence within me because I think more kids need that. And and it's not just being plus size. There's so many skinny girls and girls that are smaller that were friends of mine that felt like they had to have sex or do things or, you know, please guys still at this ripe age, you know, Mm -hmm. in your late twenties, early thirties, I know plenty of girls that feel like they have to do things just to appease men so that they'll love them or Mm -hmm. accept them them. And it goes back to the whole conversation of when you spend that time alone and you fill your own cup up, you don't need another person to do it. So now I'm at at a place in my life where I'm 31 years old. I'm single for the first time in a very long time. Um, I've been single for, uh, you know, about six months and it's such a new landscape to navigate for me. Um, you know, I feel like I'm the most confident I've ever been, the most successful I've ever been, the best dressed I've ever been. Um, I'm the most mature I've ever been, the most emotionally stable. And it's just interesting to see how many, you know, there's a lot of suitors that want to get in and I'm very protective of my space and who I'm going to allow in. And it's so funny because I feel like the tables have turned. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, if a guy gave me attention, I was like, oh, love him. Now it's like, you need to work to get my attention. You need to work to show me that you can add value to my life because my life is amazing without you. So my life would need to be extraordinary with you. So I'm not just going to let anyone in to my time, to my energy, to my body, to my space. And that took a long time. You know, it took a long time to get here. But now I'm in a place in my career, kind of in my life as well, where I'm excited to kind of, I'm taking a transition personally, but also in my career to talk more about being single for the first time and dating and what that looks like and being confident in this age range and in this new chapter of my life. And I think that it's not something I touched on a ton when I was in a relationship of the experience of being single because I wasn't and the experience of dating because I didn't have a ton of experience prior to my last relationship. I was in a relationship for a really long time. And prior to that, I was quite young. I didn't seriously date. So I feel like there's a lot I want to add to that conversation now and kind of talking about dating intentionally with confidence and kind of what that looks like. So I think Mm. I'm really excited for that. And I know my community is going to be as well. Mm. Am I correct in thinking that you have a community which is called the Confidence Crew. Yes. Talk to me about that. Yes, I love my community. So I feel like in the uh, generation of YouTube that I came up in, everyone kind of had um, a name for their community on YouTube. And it often had to do with the person. So it'd be like... (laughs) for lack of my creativity right now, it'd be like the Danny DMCers or the Danny DMC crew, or, you know, it had something to do with the, the talent. And I didn't want to do that. I was like, this is, I'm for the people. This is for my community. So let me make it about them. And right away, confidence crew came to me. I was like, I wanted to have the same letter. What am I about? You know, I just kind of had one of those days with myself where I really was just trying to think. And it came to me right away. And I kind of said it to my followers, like, what do you guys think about this? And they were obsessed with it. 
And um, so, yeah, that's how I started my YouTube intros was, you know, saying what's up to the confidence crew. And it kind of just became a thing. And I got it trademarked. And yeah, I love that. (laughs) Yeah. So where do you want to take that now? There's so many things I want to do. And I think um, I'm in a very transitional time in my life right now. I feel transitions all across the board, like every aspect of my life. And a lot of people that would scare. And of course, there's moments where I am scared. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? This is so chaotic. But I also get a rush from it. I love a thrill. I love risk. And I think, again, because I'm a confident person, I, I... you know, I, I get to that level and I'm like, Oh, I'm ready. Like, let me do something crazy. Like move to London. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, I just, I I definitely want to get more into public speaking. I do public speaking in LA and panels. I would love to do more hosting. I think it'd be really cool in London, especially like bringing an American perspective, showing that a plus size person can be on a red carpet, can be at an event interviewing people. Um, and I just want to, I always want to be more, I started these streetwear interviews as well, us street style interviews, um, in LA and kind of like all around the U S I've done one in London as well. And, um, just being with the people, being with mm-hmm. community, being able to connect and it's just not being me in front of a screen is like so important to me. And, um, just giving back, that's like ev- everything what I do, but I always feel like my whole career, I feel like. I've just reached the tip of the iceberg. Like I have so much more to give and I've always felt that way. So there's a lot coming. There will always be a lot coming. That's Mm -hmm. just the type of person I am. And there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready for all of it. So what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change the course of your life? That is a phenomenal question. But I'm going to be honest. I don't think anything seems impossible to me. I think I could do anything I wanted to do. And there, there's a lot of things I want to do that I'm like, wow, this is overwhelming. You know, I've thought of starting a clothing line. I've thought of having my own show. I've thought of having my own podcast. I've been, that's been pitched to me so many times. Um, but none of it seems impossible. It all seems really possible. And I think that has to do with the belief I have in myself. Mm. What you bring so much energy and like, I feel just you know, like maybe three points more confident. Good, I'll take like those three to, points. Well, I, and I say that is because like, I feel like generally now I feel pretty confident yeah. in myself. Good, I and I think that. a lot of like s- s- emotional and sort of like health things are kind of coming to a place where I feel like the external things don't affect me as yes, much. Good, and I think I that's that. the one thing that I've really got from you today. Yeah. It's about working on that internal yes. feeling. 100%. and you know, what your mentor said about like shutting away the world. Um, So that's actually, you know, really high number. Good, uh, I love it. And three is my lucky number. (laughs) So I'll take it. (laughs) But anyway, you just, you know, so wonderful to talk to you and like bring so much light and energy and just a a wonderful conversation. Thank you. you so much. much. Yeah, I love this. I love what you're doing and just the ability to talk woman to woman and have these, these conversations is so beautiful. So I love what you do and I'll continue to support. Thank you so much, Danny. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I am bringing Anatomy of a Leader live to a venue in London. If you'd like to be the first to find out about it, please make sure that you follow the link in the show notes to be added to the waitlist. And don't forget to subscribe or follow the show wherever you're listening.